There's this expression, great sailors are not made on calm seas, but there's a lot, I think maybe a better one, it relates to, the, to your comment, is where the high tide raises all boats. If the markets, there's some really interesting companies out here doing some really interesting things. If the public is not particularly spending money in, in a particular area, it doesn't matter how cool it is. And part of the best thing is to be careful to avoid the cool factor. Hey everybody, welcome to the Ag Tech Top Startup Series. We've mapped thousands of agriculture and food technology companies and startups globally to find the best ones. We also identify what we think are some of the best investors in the world within the space. And we're here with one of them. We have Steve Goldberg, who's the partner at Finister Adventure. Steve, thank you so much for doing this. Really thank appreciate you for your time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think when you look at agriculture ecosystem, if you're a startup or if you're a corporation, or if you're another investor interested in the space, you, you're not going to, you're not going to walk through this space without knowing who is Finister Ventures. You guys have a pretty, I think, impressive portfolio of ag tech companies, food tech companies as well. You guys done, I think, a lot of really interesting things in the space. Plus you guys publish like some really incredible annual reports on what's kind of happening across the ecosystem. I encourage everyone to go check out the website because it's some really good, you know, solid, solid research. I used it to look at the space, but Steve, maybe for those who don't know who is Finister Ventures, maybe let's just start off. Who is Finister Ventures? What is your asset under management? What do you guys typically do? What is, what is your investment piece? Sure. So the, the, we're, we're currently investing out of our third fund. The, the firm was founded back in 2006. The focus has been heavily in agriculture historically, but recently broadened to include, let's call, let's call it food and ag and associated markets. So everything from supply chain to finance, productivity tools. Literally anything that would make folks in the food and ag business, you know, in, in healthcare businesses. And it's about the current fund is about a hundred million dollars. Average check sign, first check size from half a million to about two and a half million dollars. We generally like to take a board seat. My partners and I are all ex entrepreneurs, former CEOs. I feel like we can provide a lot of value and like to be close to the investments that we make. How about that for starters? No, that's awesome. No, and it, you know, it's really interesting. We talked about this a little bit ahead of the call and why I wanted to chat with you is because I don't think, I mean, you've been a, you've been in the space, adventure space for quite a while. Previously before this, you were at Dinrock for almost, was it 10 years? Almost yep. a decade? Yep. yep. I actually remember seeing you a long time ago, seven years ago, a few, few events speaking or being a panelist talk. So you are absolutely interesting perspective, not only switching to Venrock, but also over to Finister Ventures. I'm curious, why, why did you make that switch? Why did you want to be more aggressive in, in both agri and food tech investments? Well, it's probably an easier answer than maybe it sounds. Well, first of all, um, I would say, you know, at a certain point in everyone's life, maybe, maybe earlier than later, maybe it's not a temporal thing, but doing things that are greater good kind of, you know, it, it checks some boxes for many of us. And so I would put that on the list of top five reasons why I went to Finisterre. The other ones are a little bit simpler. What the other thing I've learned, and I think this is, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll generalize it to cover it. We can talk about it if it's appropriate later, but. When you go to war, when you, when you work at a job, when you, when you do something every, and I don't mean go to war and go to war since, but when you're working hard at something and, and you put your, you know, your whole self into it, you want to be with people who you know, and who you like and who you respect. Well, it turns out one of the founders of Finisterre was one of my colleagues at Menrock. And we were in the group that actually looked at ag investments at Venrock. So I had a bit of history. He is a plant biologist, a PhD plant biologist, and I have a PhD in electrical engineering. And we sort of felt that when we went and looked at deals together, we were kind of dangerous because we could look at the, you know, farm robotics and tractors. We could look at automated irrigation systems. We, we could look at a lot of things that maybe needed perspectives from both the tech side and the bio side. And so that was, that was good. Now it turns out within Finisterre, we look at enterprise software deals. It could be a restaurant management software. We look at things that are kind of more in between or more general, have general interest to venture capitalists. But your question about why I joined, it was 
most, mostly because I had a good friend there and I had just finished up at Venrock. But I would say one of the other big reasons was it was a greater good kind of move. No, that's, that's awesome. And I know you, I think you're going to be a triple threat there because you talked earlier, you have a, not only an incredible experience, I think you did a lot of, you, you did both on the investment side, but you were also in, also within Benbrock, you were on the operational side, helping a lot of the companies you guys did invest grow. And then also you have an incredible knowledge of deep tech and you've seen the whole landscape it ag tech and outside of it. So it's, it'll be really interesting to see kind of how this evolves. Well, that, that is true. One, one of the, basically one of the big tasks that I was given at Denrock was to sit on boards and to help some of our more techie, deep tech companies. And so I, I've sat on about 20 boards, maybe more since I started uh, 12 years ago. And I like it a lot. I'm kind of, I, I probably wasn't put on this earth to be a BC. I was much more of an operating guy. At this point in my career, I've kind of blended them, but, but the net net is I've enjoyed, you know, that part of the job because it gets you close to the companies. Yeah. That makes sense. You, your title, professional board of director. <laughs> yeah. professional so, athlete. Well, yeah. I, I mean, what's kind of fun is you, you, you're again, rather than just getting something in the mail every quarter that says, here's a, here's the company update. I mean, it, it, it's nice to get you, you know, to get involved and. And also the Finisteer absolutely follows sort of the Denrock style of venture capital, which is, you know, we audit and we advise and we support, we don't run the company. It's the founders and the management's company. And I always being an, having been an entrepreneur myself, I, I put that way up on my list as the kind, you know, in terms of what was important in terms of investors that I had or I wanted to be involved with was those that recognized it's the, it's the founders and the management's company. It's not our company. We're minority shareholders. We're there to help and hopefully, you know, create a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I, I want to stay on the fund a little bit, just cause I had a couple of questions. It looks like you guys have a lot of relationships with gov different governments. Like it seems like you guys have a relationship with Ireland, or I think there's one with New Zealand. I was just curious if, if you could speak more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those were more opportunistic relationships. Turns out one of our LPs, you know, was in Ireland. And so having, having a connectivity to the, you know, the, to the ecosystem, the early stage ecosystem in Ireland made sense. One of the founders of Finisteer from New Zealand. And so heavily connected to the New Zealand government. And the, you know, the early stage ecosystem there. So opportunistic, just have, you know, related to how do you, and again, back to what I said early on, it's, you know, in real estate, it's location, 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 in venture capital, it's deal flow, deal flow, deal flow. Exactly. Well, I want to just pick apart your investment thesis a little bit more. You know, you guys have been around from 2006. I know you're just jumping in and I'm. You know, I don't know if you have too much knowledge about, you know, how your ag tech investment thesis has evolved, but maybe, maybe you could dive a little bit more deeper in today is what is, you know, the primary investment thesis that you guys are going after today? Okay. That's a good question. And it has changed over time, but I would make this sort of quick hundred thousand foot comment. You know, there's a, a second ago, I talked about sort of tech and bio, you know, cause certainly when would people say. When people say tech in general, you know, you, you think of either electronics or you think of, you know, like consumer electronics, or you think of software and enterprise software and that sort of stuff. And, and over time, I think in the general tech space, not only, I think it absolutely true in the general technology of the venture capital space, there's been a tremendous move to software. And why is that? Much lower capital requirements just to get to build a company, faster time to liquidity no inventory, limited inventory. Because so if we learned that with the first bubble burst, even though it sounds like it was a negative kind of lesson, it was actually a positive lesson for a lot of investors. Even though there was a dip in the stock market after 2000, what a lot of people learned was, yeah, maybe they invested in the wrong software companies, but software was here to stay and that was going to be a real big deal. Okay. So, so that's fine. So now you think agriculture, you think heavy industry, you've got farm animals, 
You've got genetics related to crops. You've got genetics related to animals. And we all, we know from the biotech world, actually, Venrock spent, invested about half of its money in, in healthcare and biotech. So I sat around that for a long time. And one of the things you quickly learn there, the time frames are much, much longer. But the argument is you wait longer, but the outcomes could be out, you know, outsized. It could mess about a new drug to cure, you know, a cancer cure, a vaccine, or this, you know, whatever. So biotech had, you know, kind of had its own justification, even though it's actually hard. And there are very few VCs that actually do biotech. Mainstream tech, where everybody lives, 90% of the mainstream tech investors are software only. Okay, now we're talking high tech and food tech. So where do you live? Well, you kind of straddle it. And one of the things that it's important in a fund, as we all know, is diversification. So you probably wouldn't want to invest in a bunch of real long-term genetically modified organism, you know, animal genetics companies that could take 10 or 15 years to get to liquidity. And maybe it would be hard to find a bunch of software that related to the food and ag tech world. Maybe some, again, I mentioned earlier, restaurant, backend software, whatever. So the thesis now is a blend, just like you would layer bonds if you were making personal investment choices. You lay, you know, you got one year, two year, five year, seven year. So, you know, all, you know, kind of that. It, it's the, it's not the dollar cost averaging, but it's the layering of, of, of time, you know, time frames. So that's one component. I think the other component, and, and again, everyone learns new funds, you know, learn and pivot, whatever. I think we've also recognized that the food industry has changed. And, you know, there's several, most venture capitalists, I would say most, if not all, are driven by trends. And, you know, one trend could be climate change. So investing, and you're always looking for white space. What does that mean? Areas where other investors haven't been or places where new, new, new products and markets might, might begin to build and you could get, you know, be the first one in. And so you're looking for trends so you could be first. So climate change is big. The whole pandemic effect, which has had a huge impact on lower paid workers, especially service workers, especially in restaurants where they just left and drove because restaurants all closed. And then they realized, geez, there's other jobs out in the world, gig economy jobs that paid twice as much and they can live at home. And do. A million or two million workers in the United States are probably not going to return to the restaurant industry. What does that mean? Well, people still like to go to restaurants. So how do you serve them? Like you use robotics, you use other tools. There's different, you know, there's all the delivery services, you know, the door dashes, and that, that kind of thing. So I think that answers your question in, in total, but the, the net net is over the 15 years that this fund has been around, we've kind of learned what works best to, you know, remember there's only really one number that matters, maybe two numbers that matter in venture funds, cash on cash return in IRR, right? Just the, the you know, rate of return. And you're trying to constantly work on optimizing and maximizing that. I'll, I'll stop there. No, it makes sense. And I think that's one of the most interesting and you, I think you hit it right on the spot. The, one of the biggest challenging things about the ag tech, food tech industry is you're merging software, you know, either with bioscience or you're actually right. merging that with different types of hardware devices or machinery that actually has to exist in the field or animals that are in space. Like you're playing with so many different verticals at the same time. Some of them are have much longer time frames, some are more shorter. Finding that right mix and also the white space, it's 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 really interesting, also very challenging. But you guys have been doing it for a while, so it means you find success in that, which is impressive. But one of the, I'm curious, and this is more of a question for you, Steve, because you've been within Benrock and you've invested in, you know, different, a variety of different industries. You talked a little bit earlier about biotech and healthcare. You guys did a little bit of enterprise software. You did a lot of deep tech. You touched a lot of categories. You also did ag tech. From the outside in, for most in, I guess, at least for the investor community, it looks like there's not as many exit events or not as large of exit events in agriculture or food technology. And I might be wrong. When you compare that though to, you know, enterprise cybersecurity or, you know, like some of these other categories that some investors go after. And I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you know, from your standpoint, investing in a variety of industries, now focusing in on agriculture. Are you changing your approach to investing? Is that, is that devolving at all? Or is it 
kind of go back to your previous. Oh, I no, I think that's a real good question. Absolutely. I mean, you can't be in this segment or in these two segments without recognizing there aren't as many outcomes. Okay. Now it's a fairly narrowly defined segment. So scaled, you know, you know, it's, it's, it, there's probably, you're going to expect some fewer number of outcomes given it's a smaller segment, but it might even be more than that. It might be that this particular area, there just haven't been a lot of venture outcomes. It's been, you know, there's a lot of family businesses, you know, that historically, you know, weren't venture funded, a lot of international businesses that US VCs weren't previously involved with. I would say it this way. And, and it, it's not sidestepping the question, but it's sort of addressing how you deal with it. And that is you're looking for good companies. And to be honest with you, I've looked at thousands and thousands of companies when I'm, after being in business for so long, you know, you, you look at, I don't know what did I used to say, how many companies, if I saw 10 a week and I see more than 10 a week, you know, that's 500 a year times 10 years is 5,000. That's probably on the low side, right? So after seeing lots and lots of companies, you know, many people who are good in this business, you know, you're, you're a pattern matchers, you know, you're looking for, and it's the classic thing that entrepreneurs and VCs alike talk about, well, what makes it, how do you know, how do you know which ones to invest in, right? So, I mean, and the reality is you're looking for good teams. You're looking for products and have a great product market fit. You're looking for, you know, good margins in like businesses that actually have a fair chance of making enough gross margin to pay for the expenses of developing the next product and paying salaries and so on. So when you start checking those boxes off, if you're asking, is it hard? I would tell you absolutely yes, but it really wasn't any more, any more difficult. There's only 24 hours in the day and it wasn't any more difficult or easier at Benrock. I would, I would argue the funds that have the bigger brand names sometimes get, you know, a, a higher percentage of, of better deals. But arguably, Finisphere is pretty well known in the ag and food space. So we see our share, fair share of, of, of good deals in this sector. And then it just comes down to doing the ABCs and the best thing. And someone who was one of my mentors told me this real early on when I first got into this business, there's no recipe. There's no, you know, okay, let me just look at the book. How many, what should the margin be? You know, how many employees should they have? The, there's absolutely no recipe. It's a very much a sort of combined quantitative, qualitative kind of judgment call on, on where you invest. So, yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think it's, it's not, there's no one size fits all. It is there, there is very, it's very difficult. Well, hey, Steve, I want to transition a little bit into the investment portfolio of some, I think you're the perfect guy to ask some questions, but before I get into some specifics. Just curious, you guys have around 23 portfolio companies? Might be more. I, this is what I just understand from- Oh, right that now. might be up to 30 or something like that. Yeah, there's normally more deals that exist in the background that are not ever on yeah, the websites. But just curious, is there any recent deals that you guys did that you're excited about or wanted to share? Well, there's, there's, you know, there, there's two components to, are there any big updates to portfolio companies that we've had investments in for a while now? And are there new portfolio companies? Well, it's, I got a couple. I mean, the one that's the biggest news at Finisterre is Plenty, which is a vertical farming play. Just did a $400 million round with Walmart and SoftBank. Just had a press release today, actually, that it's doing, it's building a farm for Driscoll's, the largest, you know, berry company, you know, berry provider in the world. That's a big deal. That, that, that's a big deal. Yeah. So that's, that's obviously a good one. One of our more, more recent ones, Tamvala has done a lot of TV, done a lot of TV promotional stuff. It's basically meals to go, meals, you know, deli meals delivered to the home. And then there's an oven that comes with it that basically programmed to, it's kind of like, you know, the, it's not like a curry, but it's sort of a, a you know, all in one sort of food prep, you know, and recipe slash, you know, home preparation device. And they really hit the ground running doing really, really well. And there's a lot of national promotion. So that that's doing well. And then I just made an, an investment. It actually won't be announced for a couple of weeks, but in the restaurant space, restaurant equipment space, I'm excited about that. Particularly focused on lack of in labor and, and difficulty in finding labor. So yeah, we've got another 
company that does A-B testing in like supermarkets or retail chains to find out which promotion worked better given, you know, a various set of criteria. So that's an interesting one. So yeah, that's kind of what's going on. Now, I, you know, you kind of speak volume to the, the, the breadth of portfolio companies right. and the scale. And also, I mean, you have companies like Plenty in your portfolio that's just for this year, you guys, it's like I said, you guys have a really impressive set of portfolio companies in the ag and food tech space. But actually, I want to ask you a follow-up question because when looking at your portfolio companies, it seems like you have a good amount. I would consider kind of like that frontier market. You have a mix of biotech. You have a mix of robotics. You have a lot of like alternative meats, biosciences within food. And I'm, I'm just... You know, we, we touched on it a little bit earlier, and I think you kind of already answered the question. There's no real right time or right solution for any one particular category, but especially for agriculture, it seems so difficult to understanding the timing of markets. Like when is the right time? You see, you know, an alternative food or a protein, for example, you have, you know, vegetarian based alternative meat that just explodes and you see that with impossible foods or, but then you have like, you know, the cell cultured meats that are still early at the commercial phase, really not there yet. Don't know when that timeline's going to, you know, move. When is that going to be a flexion point on, on price or vice versa? You have the carbon marketplaces that are popping up all over the place for, for farmers trying to get carbon credits, but then those working on like trying to change soils using a variety of different types of microbes that they can pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Like the timeline for research on that is really long. How, how, I mean, how are you trying to, how do you identify when is the right timing for some of these frontier markets and well, categories? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So look, I think my own personal experience has guided me that, you know, I, there's this expression, you know, great sailors are not made on calm seas, but there's a lot, I think maybe a better one. It relates to the, to your comment is where the high tide raises all boats. If the markets, there's some really interesting companies out there doing some really interesting things. If the public, not the public markets, but if the public or the, or the marketplace where the customer set is not particularly spending money in, in a particular area, it doesn't matter how cool it is. And part of the best thing is to be careful to avoid the cool factor. There's a joke too about, about demos, you know, sometimes VCs, you know, get presented with demos of products and demonstrations and entrepreneurs are really good at coming up with sexy demos saying, look at this product and you gotta be super careful because sometimes it's really difficult not to avoid thinking, oh my God, this is really neat what they're doing, whatever it is. And the reality is it doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what the customers think. So, you know, the question is, how do you know the markets have to be moving? I mean, or you have to see movement over the 10 year life of the fund. Remember these funds are about 10 years. If you got something that's 20 years out, probably not a great investment for a venture capital fund because the funds have to sort of finish up in 10 years. You know, average time to M and A is what, you know, five to eight years and average time to IPO is eight to 10 years or something kind of within the range of the. It's probably correlated in some way to the length of the funds. I'm not sure what that is, but probably. But how do you know when to invest? You got to look at the intersection of is the market moving or do you believe the trends are going such that the market will move? And then what I said earlier, the company themselves. It, it is interesting. I don't, I, I can't put a statistic on it, but it's more often than not, Companies that come out of the gate really strong usually do well. I mean, it's just, now I'm not saying there are, you know, the, 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 you know, kind of the quick up, quick down kind of thing. But again, as an intersection, if you, if you believe in a market and if, and a product comes out of the market strong, that's a good, it, just two factors. That's a good combination, right? You know, how much money do they need? For, for example, I mean, if everything else is right but you need a billion dollars to build a business like an electric car company, right? If the market timing for cash isn't great, 
everything else might be there, demand for electric vehicles, climate change, but there wasn't enough cash. Well, in the last couple of years, the stock markets have been great. There's been a lot of liquidity in the market and the climate change and the high price of oil. All of a sudden, electric cars, you know, there's a huge demand. So a few different factors, probably not a large number, but a few factors that kind of guide you to that's the lake you should be fishing in. Oh, that makes sense. And I hundred percent agree with that. You have a, do you have a hard stop at 145? Fine. That's, that's good. Yeah. Okay. I only have a few more questions left, but one of the things that I notice about the ag tech space, it's a little bit in your portfolio as well. And it finished here. There are sometimes two different directions. There is, you know, going after that innovative technology component, or there is going after that consumer brand that just really stands out. I'm assuming you're probably going to play more on the technology component and maybe not so much on the consumer brand, but I'm, I'm just curious, is that, well, that we tend be to, no, that's a great question. We tend to lean more into technology companies, especially in the food space. We probably wouldn't invest in a company that says we're going to open a supermarket. There's no tech there. Not that it wouldn't be a great business, but there's no tech. But, you know, if, what if it was a supermarket for a certain segment of the population and a kind of, you know, unique, sort of like a Trader Joe's or something years ago would have been a great investment for anybody, obviously. But we typically look for some technology and that's kind of a fun, fun choice. It's, diff it's expensive to build a brand and it takes a long time. If we thought that, I remember at Venrock, this has nothing to do with Sinister, but it's a great example. At Venrock, when I was there, one of my partners invested in Dollar Shave Club. And I don't know if you know Dollar Shave Club. It's, yeah, everybody's kind of a household name almost. And basically they were selling razors that weren't particularly special. And they were just, it was a deliver, razors delivered to your home, you know, on the monthly subscription. But the brand was everything. They have this very, very witty and bright and, and charismatic CEO who did the television commercials. And it was all about being edgy. And you're an edgy guy. You want to be part of our club, you know, Dollar Tree Club. And they spent a lot of money. They built a big brand and made money. It wasn't a technology play, and it, but it was a good venture outcome, you know, for, for the investor. We do less of that. And it's not for any reason. We just choose because we are a technical team. So we're differentiated in that sense that we have the ability to assess technology. And also, I think in general, if you have differentiated technology, it gives you one more box checked in terms of, you know, being able to separate yourself from the rest, you know, from, from competitors. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I remember seeing those crazy TV commercials. <laughs> yeah. And they did both a good brand. Yeah. I had a story behind that, but it was quite a big success. So, yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, impressive. That's awesome that your team was able to get them back that deal. Do you know, I think that's an interesting point though, that you made is it feels like if you're going after the branding, be prepared to spend some money. And if you're going after the tech, just stay focused on, you know, the outcome of the well, tech. And also I point out that there's another way to slice it. Most, you know, consumer plays or many consumer plays, there may be technology involved, but you really, you sell differently, right? You market differently, you go to market differently, which isn't necessarily bad. Tabala, I mentioned earlier, one of Finisterre investments. It's a direct to consumer. I mean, you basically got to build that brand. Every, you, hey, you have one of those? I have one. You should get one. Versus, you know, selling sides to large farming conglomerates, you know, there's different, different go to market, different strategy. We invest in both. Yeah. Got it. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I think that clears up a little bit too. I think that's also really helpful for the audience, kind of getting your perspective on that, because this is that industry that you talked about in the very beginning, where it just collides with so many different categories. But I want to transition now to more just general market questions, just to kind of get your feel and how you view the ecosystem. You know, there is a, it seems like, and you, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, this, there's massive trend right now within agriculture and then food tech on sustainability. And it's, it's, it's a theme that I think exists almost in every category now is how is everyone addressing that? I'm just curious from your perspective, why now? Why is that happening now? It's a quick, quick question. I think there does seem to be, and I don't have the statistics, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you're there to support the statement that I don't know whether it's under thirties or under 35s or under 40 year olds, you know, have a higher sensitivity to the planet 
you know, we're going to leave it in a better better way than we left it, than than our parents left it to us, you know, we're going to destroy it kind of thing. So I think there's just, plus you've got the climate change numbers, which 10 years ago, there was a lot of debate about is there climate change. I don't think there's much debate. I'll, I'll make a strong statement here. I don't, I think you got to really, really, really go into the, the, the nuances to say there's no climate change because it's all around us. And you can see it. I, I, most people now acknowledge it, even the naysayers of five or 10 years ago. So just the, you know, the world has changed and, you know, there's also the white space aspect. If that's a new category and if that's a new angle. You know, you've got these new ESG funds, right? Funds that are looking for an environmental angle or, or whatever, because of the same reasons people want to invest in companies that are doing good things. So that moves people to invest in companies that do those things. And it's kind of a flywheel effect and you just get more money in and more, and then more good companies, there's more outcomes and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but I think it's the times we live in and, and that a lot of the demographics that are involved in the businesses that were involved in customers and, and employees. Yeah, no, I think I totally agree with you. I think that there's a handful of, you know, market dynamics coming together. That's really pushing the needle and in, in creating, you know, attractive opportunities in ag tech, or at least drawing more attention to it, which kind of is that feedback cycle that you talked about earlier. Once, you know, that there's market interest in it, both from a customer standpoint and also even from investor standpoint, then there's an opportunity. But I would also say too, that technology, you know, it, it's hard to, I have this, one of my favorite sayings is you can't legislate science. It takes what it takes. So for example, let's talk about robotic tractors. So I worked at Trimble Navigation as an engineer for a long time. And Trimble basically makes GPS equipment and they, they're one of the big leaders in the world now for robotic farming equipment. So, you know, it basically automated tractors that do a gazillion different things. And they have a, a variety of products that relate to farming, for example. And well, clearly if you, if you plant your crops on row, you know, uh, rows that are a foot apart, if GPS doesn't give you enough accuracy, you couldn't have a robot know where it was going. But if you have GPS that's, you know, down to a millimeter or a couple of, you know, a centimeter, you could know exactly where to plant the seed, exactly where to pull the weed out, whatever. And it turns out over GPS started probably in the early eighties and really started launching the satellites. I forget when the first one was launched, but it's about 40 years old now. But now you can get technology relatively cheaply that can give you mill a couple of millimeters accuracy over, you know, a few acres. And for farmers, having that kind of accuracy could do a lot of great things. So as you said a moment ago, a lot of different factors have to come into play. So the technology is ready. The market's sort of interested in getting, you know, more food for a growing population. All those things just kind of came together. Interesting. Really interesting. Well, I had one more question for you, Steve, and then I'll let you go. Thanks so much again for taking so much time to chat. I appreciate it. But I'm just curious, you know, what do you, you just jumped into finished year ventures. I'm curious, what are, what are you excited about or what are you going to be looking to invest in over the next few years? Or what do you think is going to be attractive areas across agriculture over the next couple of years? Well, so I'm going to give you the short answer, not the long answer. Because I'm kind of the techie on the tech side rather than the bio side. I, I do like the robotics. I do like the productivity tools that all businesses could use, but restaurants and farms and can use all, you know, I think, you know, there's, there's, you know, the robotics market, a really excellent tool, just signal processing in general, like I'm on the board now of a company called Tyrannus out of Israel that uses drones to, with hyperspectral imaging to look at the crops, tell you, does it need water or are there pests, is there fungus, whatever. So. You call that signal processing, or some people say it's IOT, Internet of Things or whatever. But anyway, you take data from sensors and then process it and then have that guide decision-making. So I think in, in general, between the robotics and the sensors and, and then just communication tools, even there's companies out there that use the gate worker kind of mentality so that you don't have to hang out 
someone ordering, if you don't have to have order takers in restaurants, you can have the people at home and you just talk to a speaker, you know, maybe that you lost a little bit of personal, you know, interaction there. But the net net is there's some pretty cool technology side video that can be brought to bear to the food tech market that just kind of recently arrived. And that just so happens to be the kinds of things that I, I have experience with. So if you were asking the question about Steve Goldberg, what am I interested in? The natural answer is going to be the things that I'm good at and I like. And so that's, that's kind of the short list. Hey, well, you're the perfect man for the job. I mean, having the deep tech experience, jumping into the field, that's merging both the physical world with the software world and making that actually feasible. That's hard to do. <laughs> and, and, having a, and having a partner that's a, that's a plant biologist and sort of a, a bio guy. And my wife is actually a professor of molecular biology at UC Berkeley. So I'm surrounded by help. So when I need help on the bio side, I, I have it. So the, the firm is in good hands. We've sort of got both ends covered. Now, incredible. And even they you mentioned Tyrannus, which I think is one of the top companies within generally the imagery category. It's just kind of cool to show you drop in names with like plenty earlier today. And there's a ton of other great companies. You guys have finished your, finished your ventures. And I think it's just really impressive what you guys have done in the agriculture space. Steve, before I close out, is there anything that you wanted to highlight or share with the audience at all about the fund or anything interesting going on or what you're looking for? No, thank you so much for having me. And all I would say is, you know, I'm very easy to find Steve at Finisteer.com and we're always looking for new ideas. So please, please feel free to contact us. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Steve, for doing this. Like I said, part of the Ag Tech, Ag Tech Top Startup Series, try to find and identify what we think are some of the best investors and in startups within agriculture and food tech. And you get to hear it from today. I mean, Steve, you guys are incredible. Your portfolio is incredible. Your guys' background is incredible. Like your thesis is incredible. You probably probably have one of the best teams to actually approach what I think is going to be and what I know is a really hard industry to go after because it merges both hardware and software and biotech and, you know, the physical yeah. world. It's, it's such an interesting thing, but thanks again, Steve, for doing this. Okay. You're very welcome.